So with Kristen Ritter having been cast to play the role of Jessica Jones in the Netflix series that will lead up to the Defenders miniseries, I figured now would be an excellent time to do a video about her character. Now what I also want to do is I want to give a big thank you to Sal from TV Little House for helping me comb through a lot of the uh, information involving Jessica Jones and Jessica Jones, um, I guess, encounters with the Purple Man with uh, Zebediah Kilgrave because there were some misconceptions that I had about the relationship that the two of them shared. And so what we see with uh, Jessica Jones is that her character is a very important character in the realm of Marvel Comics. Now, she's not so much important because of the character that she is, because of the roles that she plays. Jessica Jones is very important in the realm of Marvel Comics because of how she was introduced to us. Jessica Jones was introduced to us in Alias in November of 2001, and she was a creation of Brian Michael Bendis. Now, at the time, Brian Michael Bendis was and was considered to be probably the most popular writer that Marvel had going at the time due to his involvement with uh, with Ultimate Spider-Man as well as Daredevil. And so what Marvel was looking to do was to launch an adult-oriented series of comics called Marvel Max. And Marvel Max would be a series of comics that we would see play out that would include sexual content, nudity, adult-oriented language, and so on. Again, these were a series of comics that were targeted specifically for adults. And so with Brian Michael Bendis having been so popular at Marvel, Marvel had reached out to him to provide the first series that would be part of the Marvel Max imprint. And this is when we saw the 28 issue series called Alias coming to fruition. Now with Alias issue number one, we're introduced to Jessica Jones as the uh, individual running something called Alias Investigations. It's a private investigation uh, team or I guess a group that she's running by herself that will allow her to track down various cases, to uh, meet with various individuals, and of course allow her to uh, create an income for herself. Now for the most part, she's successful in this because of the contacts that she has because she has contacts like uh, Carol Danvers, like Steve Rogers, and these are the kind of things that people are looking for with this Netflix series that they're hoping we'll see Carol Danvers being brought in. We're hoping, or people are hoping we'll see Scott Lang, who she had a romantic interest in for a while, being brought into the Netflix series. But over the course of the Alias publications, of course, we see her taking on various cases and, and going through various things, but her origin story isn't actually given to us until Alias issues number 23, uh, 22 through 26. Now, during these stories, we of course see that she is in an on-again, off-again relationship with Luke Cage, but her relationship with Luke Cage really seems to be more of a relationship of sexual gratification than anything else. The two of them aren't really romantically linked to one another. They're really just uh, fulfilling each other's sexual desires here. But what we learn with alias issue number 22 is that when Jessica Jones was a child, that her actual name was Jessica Campbell and that she harbored a very intense infatuation for Peter Parker. Now, she had never really been able to bring herself to make her advancements or her interest in Peter Parker known, but she was able to finally muster up the courage on the same day that Peter Parker was bitten by a radioactive spider. Now, now, because Peter Parker was bitten by the spider, his attention, of course, was taken away due to the almost immediate sudden, uh, I guess, uh, influx of the powers that he gained, which resulted in him becoming Spider-Man. And so Jessica Jones is simply, or I guess, uh, yeah, Jessica Jones at this time had simply chosen not to make her advancements known towards Peter Parker. And so what she did was she uh, began to go about her own business to continue living her own private life. But during this time, her and her family, while they're driving, are involved in a, in a car wreck with a vehicle that's transporting dangerous and uh, radioactive chemicals across state lines. And as a result, her entire family, with the exception of herself, are killed in the car wreck. And so she falls into a coma. Now she's able to finally come out of this coma due to the, the fact that uh, Galactus and Silver Surfer are attacking the planet Earth. And when she comes out of this coma, she's uh, informed by a social worker that of course her family is dead and that she's going to be put into a foster home with a family called the Joneses. Hence the reason she began becomes Jessica Jones. This is her adopted name. And so with alias issue number 23, we pick up where she's re-enrolled at Midtown High School by the Joneses in an attempt to uh, make sure that she's able to maintain this level of consistency in her life. But because of the fact that she had fallen into a coma, she's ridiculed at the hands of Flash Thompson and other people and simply just referred to as Coma Girl. Now, one important thing to bear in mind is that at this point, Peter Parker has already developed his powers. He's already playing out the role of Spider-Man. 
And so Peter Parker is one of the few individuals who tries to reach out to her. In fact, he's probably the only individual that tries to speak with her. But because of all the ridicule that she's received up to this point, she takes his attempt at conversation to be an attempt to make fun of her. And so she runs away. Now, when she's running away, she begins to have flashbacks to the car wreck with her family, to the social worker telling her she's going to be put into a foster home, and her powers of flight manifest. Now, again, she doesn't really know how to control these abilities. And so what we see with her character is that she basically lunges high into the air and then lands in a river. And when she lands in the water, she's immediately uh, rescued by Thor. Now from here, she begins to experiment with her power. She begins to experiment with what it is that she's capable of. And what she learns is that she has some measure of super strength when she picks up her bicycle with very little effort. And so when she puts this to the test, she's able to physically push over a tree. And so what she does learning about these newfound abilities is she goes out and uh, comes across a scenario with a scorpion, an enemy of Spider-Man, is trying to rob a laundromat, and she's successfully able to stop the scorpion. Now from here, we're going to take a detour from the Alias comics, and we're going to jump to Amazing Spider-Man issue number 601. And during this story, we of course see a conversation taking place between Jessica Jones and Peter Parker, where she tells Peter Parker about her life when she was younger, about how they had both gone to the same school, about how she had had an interest in Peter Parker. Peter Parker doesn't really remember her. He tells her he doesn't really recall her, that the only thing he recollects is that she was referred to as the coma girl, but aside from that, he doesn't really remember anything. But what Jessica Jones says is that at this time, when she was younger, she had seen Peter Parker, had seen Spider-Man fighting, uh, fighting the Sandman. And because of this, she had decided she wanted to be a superhero. She wanted to model herself after this ideology and had decided to take on the role of being a superhero. And so from here, we switch to Alias issue number 25, and we pick up with Jessica Jones as she's continuing the story with her friend at this time, Luke Cage. And what she does is she gives us some very valuable insight in terms of what it's like not only to be controlled by the Purple Man, but what her life was like while she was controlled by the Purple Man. And what we learn here is that after she had undertaken the role of being a superhero, she had adopted the codename Jewel. And with the name Jewel, she began to go along the process of fighting various villains and so on. But there came a point whereby she was investigating a disturbance at a restaurant. And there were two individuals inside this restaurant who were fighting one another, while a man who was completely purple, dressed in a purple suit, was watching the events unfold. And this man, of course, we know was Zebediah Kilgrave. And what he does when he realizes Jessica Jones is there is immediately take over her mind. He tells her that she's a very beautiful woman, and then using his mind control powers, tells her to undress herself. Now, before she's actually able to expose any of her genitalia, he tells her to stop and to uh, to stop the police forces outside of the uh, restaurant, which of course have arrived in an attempt to quell the domestic disturbance and figure out what's going on. And what Jessica Jones begins to tell us is that from this point, and over the course of the next eight months, she was totally kept under the control of Purple Man. That Purple Man, despite the fact that he had uh, engaged in a multitude of, uh, of various sexual endeavors had never actually forced, uh, I guess, forced Jessica Jones to have sexual contact with him. And this is where my misconceptions began to come into play. And this is where Sal had uh, corrected a lot of this information that I had. What, what Zebediah Kilgrave had done or what he would do is during this time, he would go out and he would uh, take over the minds of a couple of female college students. And then he would take them back to a hotel room and he would force the female students to engage in sexual acts with one another, as well as sexual acts with himself, and then he would force Jessica Jones to watch. And as he would force her to watch, he would force her to beg uh, the Purple Man to allow her to join in, but the Purple Man would never let her do it. And of course, when there were not any college students for, for uh, Purple Man to uh, kidnap, he would simply just force Jessica Jones to uh, beg the Purple Man to allow her to have sex with him, but he, would, again, would never actually allow her to do it. And as Jessica Jones explains it to to us, the entire concept was extremely unrealistic, but at the same time, it seemed as though it was something that she wanted to do. And what I mean by this is, it's not as though she had done it of her own free will. The way she explains it to Luke Cage, the thought seems to be something that comes from her own mind, despite the fact that the Purple Man is forcing her to do it. And so it's an organic thought. It's a realistic thought as far as her mind thinks. And so for her, she genuinely believed it was something she really wanted to do because it was a thought that was put in the mind of her by Purple Man. Now, over the course of these eight months, as she explains to uh, Luke Cage, there came a point 
when Zebediah Kilgrave had, uh, I guess, told her to go kill Daredevil. And the reason why is because he was very angry at the fact that he had never been able to figure out who Daredevil was, and that Daredevil had consistently been able to thwart his schemes in an attempt to, uh, to I guess, engage in some kind of nefarious activity. And so what he does is he tell her, tells her to either go to the Baxter building or go to the Avengers mansion or wherever, but to find Daredevil to kill him and to kill whatever superhero she encounters along the way. And so she immediately takes off. And what she does is she gives us again a little more insight into what it's like to be controlled by the Purple Man. What she tells uh, Luke Cage is that the further away she got from the Purple Man, the more that his uh, his pheromones, his mind control began to wear off. But the problem here is that while she knew what she was doing was wrong, while she knew that she didn't want to do it, she couldn't help but do it. And so along the way, she encounters the Scarlet Witch and she immediately attacks the Scarlet Witch because her mind does not not make the connection between the fact that the Scarlet Witch is not Daredevil. She simply just sees the Scarlet Witch, sees the Scarlet Witch is dressed in red, and immediately attacks her. And so what we do is we see that her, that once she realizes that she's attacked the Scarlet Witch, she tries to take off. She tries to escape, but of course she's pursued by the Avengers. And from here, we switch to alias issue number 26. And with alias issue number 26, we see of course that as the Avengers are going against her, that Carol Danvers realizes who she is. Now, Carol Danvers doesn't know who uh, Jessica Jones is on a personal level. She simply knows who Jessica Jones is in the, in the sense that she's a superhero. And so while the Vision is pummeling Jessica Jones due to the fact that Jessica Jones had attacked his wife at the time, Carol Danvers is able to help Jessica Jones escape. But the problem here is that Jessica Jones, due to the fact that there's no influx of control or pheromones from uh, the Purple Man, her mind ends up shutting down. She ends up falling into a coma. And once she wakes up from this coma, she of course realizes that the various Avengers are here, and she goes into this guilt-ridden trip. Now, during the time that she was in this coma, during the time that she was unconscious, she was visited by Jean Grey. And what Jean Grey tells her is that that she's here or she's there to help Jessica Jones get past all this, to help Jessica Jones move, move beyond where she was in terms of the psychological trauma that she had endured at the hands of the Purple Man. Now, what we also see here is Galactus walking around inside the mind of Jessica Jones. Now, we don't exactly know why uh, Galactus is here. It may very well be that this is simply a, a recollection of Jessica Jones when she had woken up from her first coma when Galactus was attacking the planet Earth, but most likely, this is due to a, a psychic defense that, that Jean Grey has put in place, something that we will see manifest itself later on in the, uh, in the purple event. But once Jean Grey is able to help Jessica Jones get past the Stockholm Syndrome she was suffering for and her belief that Purple Man genuinely loved her, Jessica Jones again wakes up out of her coma. And so Jessica Jones begins to go through the uh, psychological and physical therapies that are involved in helping her get past this entire conflict. Now, over time, after an uns uh, unspecified amount of time, we eventually learn that she's revisited by the Avengers, and the Avengers tell her they apologize for attacking her in such a way. They apologize for uh, for simply just uh, pummeling her, more or less. They had uh, recently come off of a high-stress mission, and so what they say is that if she's interested, there's a place for her on the Avengers team if she chooses to join. But Jessica Jones says no. She says that she felt as though nobody cared that she was gone. During the eight months, nobody had realized that she was gone, that her mother had felt as though she had simply just stopped talking to her, that no one had been concerned of the fact that she had simply just vanished. And so what she does is she takes this time to leave and she ultimately forms alias investigations. So with the final issues of Alias, issues number 26, 27, and 28, what we had seen is that Jessica Jones and Luke Cage began to form a relationship with one another due to the fact that Jessica Jones had become pregnant because of the uh, sexual, I guess, uh, relationship that her and Luke Cage had. But what we saw with Alias is that with issue number 28, the series came to a close in January of 2004. Now, what Marvel was looking to do was to find a way to capitalize 
eyes on the overwhelming success of Jessica Jones and the Alias series, but the issue that they had was that due to the fact that the story was part of Marvel Max, they weren't able to actually fold the character over into any of the main storylines or any of the main Avengers teams without bringing her into the uh, the mainstream Marvel comics. And so what they had to do is they had to remove her character from Marvel Max and introduce her into the main Marvel, uh, Marvel mainstream comics. And so what they did is in June of 2004, Brian Michael Bendis launched a series called Pulse. But the problem here is that Pulse only lasted for about 14 issues, running until 2006. And Pulse was considered very lackluster in comparison to Alias. And this was an idea that was, I guess, maybe coming from the, the concept of looking at Jessica Jones and having her play out the role of a writer for uh, the Daily Bugle, who was writing a column called The Pulse, which was really more of an attempt of J. Jonah Jameson to use the newspaper as a means to smear superheroes, which was the reason why Jessica Jones ended up leaving The Pulse in the uh, in the end, and of course uh, became a background character from that point going forward. And this is what we see with her character. After the events of Alias and after the events of Pulse, Jessica Jones very rarely ever becomes a character who steps into the limelight. She does to a degree, she redons her costume for a short time as Nitrous, but for the most part, she is a character who is relegated to the background. During Civil War, for example, she's only in the comic for a short period of time when Tony Stark and uh, Carol Danvers travel to visit her and Luke Cage in an attempt to bring them to the side of Tony Stark. And this was, of course, something we had talked about in our Civil War videos. But what we had seen with Jessica Jones is that she and the daughter of uh, herself and Luke Cage, Danielle, had traveled to Canada in an effort to stay away from everything that was going on with the Superhuman Registration Act in the United States, while Luke Cage stayed behind to fight on the side of Captain America. And again, over the course of her comics, this is how we see her portrayed. She actually doesn't get a solo comic of her own anymore after the events of Pulse. She simply just appears in various events and stories. She, of course, was, uh, I guess, a relatively uh, large part of the Secret Invasion event, but more so after the events of Secret Invasion than the Secret Invasion event proper. And so again, we see her character simply falling away from the limelight. We see this element of her that made her very unique in terms of her introduction and the stories that made her interesting in Alias begin to give way to her simply just kind of falling behind. Now from here, the really interesting concept here, the really interesting discussion is the question of what is Marvel going to do with her character when she actually gets her own Netflix series? Is Marvel going to adapt her character to play the same kind of role she had played in The Pulse? Or are we going to see this alias type of character with Jessica Jones? And if we do see this alias character, is Kristen Ritter the kind of actress who is going to play out the very dark and the very gritty roles that we had seen uh, Jessica Jones playing in the alias comics? Are we going to see a situation whereby she's forced into a position of a subservience at the hands of a person who can control minds? Is Purple Man even going to be a part of the Netflix series? These are questions that a lot of people have, and at this point, it's really too early to know for sure. I would go as far as to say that Marvel's probably still fleshing out a lot of the plots and still trying to figure out what they're going to do with regards to her character. With that being said, we're going to go ahead and bring this video to an end. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, let me know, and I will catch you guys later. Peace.